So my name's Edgar, and I'm going to be presenting um, chapter three review of our modeling fundamentals. So the way I understood this chapter is before going into the actual like tidy models of how to use, you know, modeling in the tidyverse framework, they kind of said, well, let's take a step back and let's go to, you know, not the old way of doing tidy models, but, you know, the original um, iteration of how to model in R. And so what they do is, they, you know, they kind of take you back to, you know, base functions and kind of give you this uh, framework of to use when, you know, when you when you finally get to the tidy model. So they go over, you know, the formal syntax that is used, in, that was used in S and then eventually ported over to R or implemented in R. And then a list of conveniences for modeling that is reported within the formal syntax, like, uh, that you can log and you can use uh, other things like that. And then, you know, they teach you ANOVA to compare models, the summary function to inspect models, the predict function to generate new predictions, and then the, the list, and then the list of three purposes of using the R model formula, what it serves, and then um, why they decide to, you know, redesign the original modeling with the new framework of designing it for humans rubric and then you know eventually coming out with tidy models um, and then they introduce you know tidy the broom for the tidy function from broom to standardize the structure of our models and then finally they use you know the tidyverse along with the lm function to produce you know multiple models at once and i think something that i noticed in this book is and I mean, this chapter is not anywhere do they say, you know, using the old way is bad at all. You know, obviously they go through the good, good, the advantages of using the old way and the, you know, disadvantage, disadvantages of using the old way. But, you know, ultimately they say, you know, because of the disadvantages, we decided to, you know, create this new, this new meta package that will kind of alleviate some of the disadvantages that we've noticed throughout. And so in the chapter versus like in this book club, they use different, you know, data sets, but I think, you know, the overall um, idea is pretty much the same. And so in this uh, R markdown or book down, they're using the trees data set. And so the data set consists of tree volume uh, based on girth and height. And so you know, here you have a table of 31 by uh, 30 with the girth and height and, you know, the girth and the height, you know, influence the volume. Um, you know, we can go into this, but I don't think, you know, here's the formula for calculating volume, but I don't know much of importance it has in our discussion, more about like, you know, the relation, there is a relationship going on between girth and height in how, you know, influences volume. Um, and so the first thing they do, you know, is look at a correlation between girth and volume and each of the variables. And so what you can do is you can use a core package to do a correlate on each of your variables. And so what it does is like, well, obviously girth to girth, there's no relate, you know, they're the same. And it does from girth to height and volume to height and the inverse, you know, obviously this would be the inverse. And so you can just look at the bottom half and I know there's ways to do this, but you can see there's a, you know, one meaning there's a positive relationship and it, it goes from negative one to one and zero meaning, you know, there's really no relationship in the higher, I mean, the closer it gets to one, the stronger it is and the negative, the less. And so you can see there's a strong positive relationship between girth and volume here and uh, about not so much when it comes to height and volume. And so, you know, as always, you want to you know, visualize your data as well. And you can see that um, there's a lot of the volume, a lot of the uh, trees that have a girth, a volume, a higher volume are consisted of having higher girth and higher height. And then there's a lower distribution or a lower number of trees with volumes of 20 down here. And so, you know, you can say, well, is there a positive relationship? Is it linear? Is it what? So not, is it not? Um, I think in kind of some of these assumptions about linear regression, you kind of have to assume there's a linear relationship. And so you might say, you know, 
there is one. Um, so to, and then you go on to, well, you know, Tidy Models has a specific way of using linear regression, but they kind of go into, well, let's go how the original inception uh, uh, for using a fitting a linear regression model to predict volume, they use the LM function in uh, base R, I think, I think it's in base R. And so LM takes uh, multiple arguments. The first argument is going to be your outcome variable. Uh, which should be to the left side of the equation. And this designates the equation with the tilde. So the left side would be, you know, your outcome variable, what you're trying to predict. And on the right would be your predictors, everything that you're using to predict, uh, in our case, volume. And then ultimately at the end is your data equals trees. And so the output, you save that and you output it and here, you know, returns your formula and it designates, you know, formula. Um, and we'll talk about it, like the formula, giving that formula argument later on. And then it gives you your coefficients and, you know, the traditional, you know, an increase in girth uh, results in a 4.7 increase in volume and so forth. Uh, so in terms of this dot designation, I don't know too much about it. So I don't, yeah, I kind of, I understand what it does, but I don't know the actual fundamental reason behind it, but essentially it's telling you, you know, um, take volume as my outcome variable, uh, put it in an equation and then place everything that is within the trees data set as a predictor if that makes sense. I think that's the way I understand it. Um, I'm not sure if, uh, I'll, I'll talk about that later, but um, that's one way of noting it. If you don't want to, you know, if you have 50 predictors, that's a way to get around listing all 50 of them. And I think in this meme here, they kind of, you know, emphasize that, you know, we only have two here, but imagine if you had 50 or more, you know, 10 or 15, it kind of gets cumbersome to write them all. And so you can get around that by using that dot notation as a avenue of, you say, you know, take everything else and use it as protector that's, you know, listed. Does that make sense, the dot notation? Okay. So in addition to that, you can then use, you know, some of the tidyverse text and especially specifically you can use the pipe and I think this is I kind of got a little confused here and I watched some of the older videos and they had a discussion of whether this what the inclusion of formula does and what the purpose of adding the formula when using the pipe and from what I got was that the formula should be included when using a pipe because I think the pipe understands this dot notation may get confused with the dot notation, as it said here. Um, I'm not quite sure exactly if anybody else understood it differently. They like to chime in. So I was kind of low. In this example, right, trees is not going to be the first argument. Yeah. So to tell the pipe that, okay, trees is actually going to be a different argument, then you use that dot. So that's why it says data equals dot. Um, and so they're saying those two dots will get confused with each other. Okay. Yeah, unless you yeah. wrap that first argument in formula. Okay, that makes sense. And I knew I, I had some inclination from when I watched the videos, I had to do something with the ordering and, you know, but that makes sense, thank you. And so if we continue on, then we talk about the interactions. And so there are interaction terms and I, you know, I'm not have a huge background in stats. So, you know, if anybody else wants to correct me, but I think the interaction terms, you know, basically from my understanding means like, in addition to like girth and height alone, there's some interaction be between girth and height that is driving or influencing that outcome variable. And so you may want to observe that and see if it you know, has any relationship in terms of the outcome. And I know in the book, they emphasize, well, if you have, if you believe there's 
an interaction term, you can include it in the model and in like one model and then not in another model and then use ANOVA to compare the models. And then in doing so, you can determine, you know, does it have any significant difference? And if it does, then you can include the interaction term. And if there's no significant difference, um, then you can, you know, not have the interaction term. And I think those are some diagnostic tests that, you know, you yourself have, have to, you know, determine should I include it or not? But I think, you know, you have the tools to really determine should I have this interaction term. And so in terms of output, so it's it's gonna carry, it's gonna use girth. So since you include the interaction on girth and height, it says, well, let's, you know, the volume, girth to volume, and then height to volume, and then height and volume together their interaction and their togetherness, how does that you know, influence the outcome variable? And so in your output, you're gonna see three. And so then if it can get very, you can get a lot if you're, you know, have, in our case, we only have two, uh, but it can get a lot if you have, you know, five or six uh, predictors and you wanna see the interaction between every single one of them. Um, and so, I think the, the include this identity function here and the identity function allows you to do literal math with the predictors. And so in this case here, they're uh, squaring girth. And so if you wanted to do like plus one girth or, you know, girth divided by height or whatever, then you can do that as well. And it would enter and uh, understand it as actual formula notation and actual you doing literal math versus if you did it outside, it wouldn't really understand it. And so if you, there is, for some reason, you need to uh, like, lo uh, not log, but like, you know, whatever you need to do what, that includes literal math, then you have to use this identity function. Otherwise, it won't understand it. Uh, okay. And so the same thing is going to pop up in there. Uh, in your output, it's gonna, you know, oh, it told you, you told it to do um, some math. And so it's gonna, you know, return whatever math you did so you can understand and, you know, recognize that you did math, I think. And so you can see there is a difference when it, you don't, you know, you just feed it girth by itself versus girth with the identity function uh, and it girth, you know, squared. And so you can see that, that there is a much big difference in terms of how uh, girth squared versus girth alone uh, drives or influences that outcome variable volume. And so then if you, above here, we just did it for girth itself. Uh, if you wanted it, you could also do it for more than one variable. And so if you do the same notation, that dot notation and then you just um, square it, then you should be able to, you know, do the same uh, kind of math on the rest of the, the rest of the uh, predictors. Uh, sorry, I have a question here. So I th think that in, in this second example, you did not use the I notation. So it's, it's uh -huh. not the same as. No square within the eye, am I, am I right? Yeah, so it's not technically quite the same. Um, so I think this one is actual literal math, while I think this one is like a polynomial term. So I don't think you're actually just doing math versus I think a polynomial function, I think, or um, yeah, somebody might have a. It's, that's not um, the polynomial. Oh, okay, then. Oh, shouldn't sure. be. So if you look at the output underneath, you have the intercept um, earth, like in the second example, the yeah. height, and then you have the one with the, with the colon in between. So that's the interaction. This one. Yeah. So, so it's basically the same as when we wrote it with the multiplication sign. 
but it, it wasn't multiplication, but a way to tell the formula to, to use the interaction term. Yeah, I think the, the notation in that example that's highlighted is make all two-way interactions. But we should probably just open R and try it out. So if there were more than two uh, independent variables, they would show up here if you use the dot uh, exponent two. Yeah, I think it would. So I think, yeah, I think that. Thank you. So I think it is another short, then it must be another shorthand for using interaction terms when you have more than one. Okay, thanks. Okay, that's good. Um, so then if we continue on, um, I think Hannah, did you come up? Sorry? Did that work if you add more than one? Yeah, I actually than, just does tried it work the if same you have three? as the one in the, in the chat. Okay. If you copy okay. that and paste it in, somebody learns faster than me, yeah, <laughs> but it's the same parts. example. <laughs> that I tried okay. and you get a lot of two-way interactions. But okay, that was it. So then I guess I was wrong. Um, so then this just is another way of shorthand of saying, you know, use interactions on every single predictor that was included in the data set. So thank you. Yeah, that. and it's specifically two-way interactions. Like if you, interact. if you change the caret symbol front and then like to the power of two, but to the power of three, then you get like even more and you get three-way interactions. Okay, three-way interactions between every single predictor then? Depending on what you put. Okay. All right, so then if we continue on, you can also then exclude if you have, you know, all predictors, but then you wanna, exclude certain ones as well, then you can do that as well using the negate sign, ne negate negative. And, you know, in this example, it's, you know, remove height from all the predictors listed. And so this part was confusing for me. Um, I think one of the many that was confusing was removing the intercept and so if you can remove the intercept if you need to by adding zero, but for me, that did not make sense of when you would have to remove the intercept or why you would have to remove the intercept. Um, I know sometimes it doesn't intuitively make sense to have an intercept there. Um, like, you know, that's the intercept is 69, but like what happens when you have a negative intercept, you can't have a negative volume. Um, so, I mean, in terms of, I think this just means you would just put, remove the intercept to just have it at zero to say, you know, tree volume is at zero, I think. So is it a uh, way of forcing the intercept to be zero? So it's, it's still in the model, but it, but you force it to be, to be zero I or? I think so. I think that's the understanding that I got. So the, yeah, yeah you, so the, you wouldn't have any intercept. It's actually, this is a bad example for this. The example in the book is better. When you have qualitative variables, you're, you have a base group that is the intercept term. And then the coefficients for the other groups are then the difference from that base group. 
but if you remove the intercept, then each group gets their own coefficient, and then the coefficient is the mean for that group specifically, rather than the difference. Uh, so <laughs> I don't know if that made sense to anybody, but we can talk about it more later if you want. I've actually never used plus zero. I've only used minus one. I don't know if they're the same, but. Okay. Um, yeah, so I think that was something that threw me off, but I think the example. Yeah, the crickets the example actually would make more sense for this to like remove an intercept. So in the cricket example, the intercept is like the mean for species one, and then the coefficient for species is the difference between species two and species one. But then if you remove the intercept, then the coefficient is just mean species one, mean species two. Um, so yeah, if you scroll down, uh, actually up to where they just have the cricket model. Uh, I don't know where it is. Here? Yeah, no. so the intercept right there, um, that's the mean, let's see right here. So intercept minus seven, that's the mean, well, it would be for temperature equals zero, but let's just ignore that fact for now. So that's like the mean chirps per minute for species one. And then minus 10 is then the difference between species one and species two. So the mean actually for species O nivaeus would be minus 10 plus minus 17. Um, but if we ran this model with the plus zero, then you would have a coefficient for each species. You should actually do that. If you run that model with plus zero, then you can see species O. nivaeus should have a coefficient of minus 17. And that's because of the category of giving it a categorical variable. Yeah. Right. Okay. So I think it, yeah, it does that a lot. I mean, it does that, I think. No, it does that when you feed it as a predictor, it defaults to one. I think it's that defaulting aspect of where it has yeah, to have so, a reference level. Yeah, because, well, this is more on like the math side of it, but when you do least squares, your X matrix has to be full rank. And so if you have a, um, an intercept and an indicator for every level, then you're not, your matrix is not full rank. So that's a little more on the map side of it. So I think I'll try that um, and then I'll put it in Slack see what I come up with, or somebody's done that already, of having uh, on the empty cars with the intercept zero when you have a, I mean, I'll, I'll use the chirps data set if that works, or somebody else has done that already to see what output it gives you. Okay, um, so since so now they take the data set, they set the seed for reproducibility, and then they add a new column in group. Um, the letters, the first four letters of the alphabet, and what they're doing is now creating a group to kind of show as examples of what have of you know combining some of the tidyverse functions and the piping and the mapping in conjunction with modeling to kind of give us, you know, um, why don't we 
take it a step further and kind of, uh, you know, improve upon what happens when you want to do it at a group level of modeling at the group level. And so what you have now is you have girth, height, and volume at for specific groups. And so you might consider, you could consider those groups, for example, like a species of tree or something like that, or, you know, uh, region or anything like that of, you know, this group here, group B, and then group D and so forth. And so I think last week we talked, uh, somebody mentioned what that hot encoding was, or in, I mean, hot, I think hot encoding or encoding in general. Um, I think this is where it comes into play here is that in category, when you introduce a categorical variable in your linear model, um, it by default uh, chooses the first level as your reference group. So you can see here that it excludes it from the summary output. And so, you know, we have group B, group C, and then group D, and you're like, well, where is group A? Um, group A is the reference group. And so it's group B in comparison, you know, to group A as being the reference group. And then group C to group A, group D to group A. And so it does that by default, but then they give you, so you can, um, so, so that does that by default, but under the hood, it's using this model matrix volume, model matrix function to turn all um, these columns into zeros and ones, which models interpret much better than categorical variables will, or at, or do a better job at. And so it's just turning, you know, group B, is it a one, is it a B or not? Um, is it a C or not? Or is it a D or not? And so you can do this yourself here. I think you have the ability to try to turn these into W variables um, or encode them yourself, or you can just feed it into the model and it does it for you as default. It recognizes that it's a categorical variable and then says, you know, let's, uh, use the first level as a reference group. Um, so I think, uh, does that make sense? I think. So I think using, um, there is, I think using the four cats or the factor function, you can then, you can change the reference group here, uh, but you have to, I think you have to do like factors and then levels and then reassign the levels using you know, you can use a four cats or you can use base R or whatever you use, then you can change swap around. And so if we wanted to make group B for whatever reason, a reference group, then we would change that to make it level, make group B level one, and then A would appear here and so forth. And so you can um, be careful in that if your, the group you're interested in is not the first group, then it might, you know, influence your summary output. Hey, so quick question. Um, in yeah. the LM call, if there's a categorical variable, it does the dummy for you, like automatically? Yeah. Okay. So it does uh, that. Okay. Yeah. Because I'm, I'm thinking like the step dummy in uh, tidy models. And yeah. So I think it's kind of the, it's kind of like the equivalent of that. I think I would, it's, you're being explicit about it versus it doing it for you. Okay. You always want to be explicit in some of your calls for like reproducibility. So people aren't like, oh, well, how did that get, how do you get there or something like that? But yeah, I think I would, I would say it's the same as the step dummy or, you know, just doing it yourself. Um, okay, so then we come into polynomials. And I think, again, I think Hannah emphasized or spoke about this earlier about, you know, the interaction terms and how it can get very, It can get a lot when you have more than one. And so you have, you know, all your regular predictors here and then girth to height, girth to group B, group girth to C and so forth. And so it's kind of, you know, what we talked about earlier, but now with more of it. And so you can see, you know, again, the intercept does make sense in this case. And you have, I don't know how you can, how do you interpret when you have girth and height as a negative? It's from, 
You can't interpret main effects when you have an interaction. Okay. It's like a big no-no <laughs> because the actual okay. slope for girth will depend on height and the actual slope for height will depend on girth. Okay, so then that's good to know. It's interaction. So then is it every, you include one interaction and then you can't use the regular predictors? Well, you just can't interpret that and, main effect by itself okay. because it, it right. depends on the other values. Do you also remember, like, I vaguely remember something about that if you have an interaction term in there, you should not take out the main effects? Yeah, yeah, you shouldn't. Um, Why was that again? That is more of, I don't remember them talking about it in the book. It's just bad practice. Um, and then, I mean, if you take out the main effects, what would that mean? I mean, mathematically, it seems a little weird. Um, yeah, I just like remember that from my undergrad way back then, but I don't remember why. I just remember like, well, don't take out the main effect. Yeah. So it's I was wondering like, if you knew that since you've been so on top of all of the interaction uh, interpretations. It's like an assumption on the model shape. Like for, for this, it's a little harder to explain, but if you think about like the quadratic model, if you don't include the linear term, then you're assuming uh, that it's a specific shape because you need all three. You need the linear term and the quadratic term to describe the whole curve. Uh, I think, can I just jump? I think in a case like this, I could be wrong because it's been a bit of time, but I feel like if you were to try and interpret just the coefficient on girth, it would be assuming that there are zeros for everything girth is interacted with. So this like the, the negative five there would be the coefficient if height were zero and you were in the reference, the main group, like the reference group. So in order to really know what the effect of girth is, you have to say, I'm gonna be in this group and I'm gonna have a height of five yeah. or, or you plug those in. So you have a little formula. So it'll be this negative 0.5 times girth plus whatever the coefficient is on the interaction term plus coefficient new interaction term. To interpret it alone is making the assumption everything else is zero and or the reference group, um, which is usually not what you want. Like, you should, okay, girth, the effect of girth is negative if height is zero, but why would height be zero? So something like that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That's, thank you. Yeah, that's why I think sometimes people always center and scale their predictors because then zero would be at the mean height this is the effect of girth. Um, I don't think they did that in any of these examples, but it sometimes makes things more interpretable if you center them, for sure. Okay, so I think we have, okay, maybe I should speed this up a little. Um, so the purpose of the R models then is to, you know, define the columns that you use within the models and um, to encode them in an appropriate format if you do include, you know, categorical variables. And then if the roles of the columns within there, if there's any interactions or, you know, anything else or math that you're, lit or math that you're doing. And so, you know, all these three different types of purposes are seen in each of the models. I mean, in the, or can be done in the models. Um, and so expecting, I mean, inspecting and developing models. So, you know, as is common practice, you kind of want to visualize your, uh, your fit and your residuals and stuff like that. And so you can use the uh, plot function within um, R, base R for specific model to visualize uh, four different things for main di diagnostic plots. And so you can do the residuals and fitted to see if the residuals have a non-linear pattern. Um, and then you can use a normal QQ plot to see 
if both sets of residuals are identical, you can use a, a scale location to plot to see if residuals are spread evenly among the range of predictors. And then the last one you can do is uh, residuals versus leverage plots to identify any influential cases. And so in this case, in here, and so this is the way of the PAR, I think that's how you pronounce it, it is a way of saying, you know, uh, organizing your plots. So I think it's one row with two places, if I'm correct. That always got me confused, I think. And then if you switch it like two to one, I think then it becomes two stacked on top of each other. Um, but that's just a way of, you know, you can always look that up and I think arrange it. And since there are four, you, you know, you specify, you know, one, which is the residuals and then two, which is a normal QQ in your plot. And you have, you know, kind of a U-shaped uh, residuals and fitted here. Um, I'll continue on. And so you can do the same thing in R, I mean, in G, using ggplot. Uh, um, with the auto plot function, again, you're specifying which of the two you want. If you don't specify it, it just, it'll just give you all four of them at once. Um, and so again, it's the same plot from above, but just using ggplot. So another mean. So earlier um, we, by store, um, you know, saving the fit into, you know, I think at our reg fit, you could, uh, you can just run it and it'll give you the summary or there's another way in, I think, I think this is use the file summary function is another way to display your output, uh, your results. And so here you have more information than we did before. And so you have your residuals uh, your mean and median and max, and then you have your coefficients, you know, displayed in a different way with, you know, your standard error. Um, I mean, your, yeah, your standard error and then your p-values and then your significance and everything like that and your R squared. And so this is another way if you needed more information or you kind of want more information uh, of another way of another fun helper function. And you can see now there are, so I think this is kind of something they were trying to highlight in the book is that there are multiple ways of doing the same thing. Um, so we could have used a summary, fu a summary function or we could have just, you know, uh, outputted the, the fit itself. And those are two ways of, you know, outputting uh, the results, um, something to be highlight, or then you can even do carrying over that the regular way. And then using the tidy function is another third way that you can display results. And so they're kind of, again, highlighting, you know, there's a lot of ways to do one thing. And so, well, maybe, what if we had a standardized way of doing stuff or doing modeling? And so, and then here's another, another way. And so what it's doing here is it's getting every single, it's taking the rows each single row and the columns associated with each row and displaying them. And again, it's another way to display your model, your model output. Has anybody used any of the like this? I've never seen, I've never encountered this, this one. I've always used either the tidy one with broom or summary function have been the most common ones I've used. And so then if you want to do, you know, if you're trying to do different models, so, you know, when you want to do an inter uh, regression model and interaction model, I think that's what it stands for, a polynomial mo model and then no height, no intercept. So what you feed it, a let you feed all your models after you've, you know, created them and put them into a list. And then using the map, so per has map functions. And then this one specifically here is to create a data frame. And so I think, so you, you feed it and then you use the map function and your results are gonna be stored as a data frame or come, you know, I'll put it as a data frame. And the arguments you need to include is your data, 
and then what each of the, what the columns I think what the columns are outputted at or what the new column is going to be. So here you can see you know the ID is then each of the names of the function of the models or the fits. And then you select, you know, in, in this case, you're interested in the adjusted R squared. So you select the ID and the adjusted R squared, and then you arrange. And so if you're interested in, well, which of these models, you know, is the best, then you, this is one technique of, you know, using tidy verse in combination with model, with models to kind of, you know, do something that you could otherwise, that you otherwise would be able to do just doing each of these independently which would you know, be a lot cumbersome. So again, this is another way of you know, introducing you know, the benefit of tidyverse and some modeling. So earlier we, it was the create, the added a group. So here it's kind of taking on the same kind of Oh, earlier we did about modeling. Now let's you know do each of our models at the group level. And so you know you nest your group, you nest the trees data, you nest it by groups, and we had groups A, B, C, and D. And then you fit the model to each of the groups, and then you convert those coefficients into a data frame. And then you use the glance function on fit for each of the models. And then you return and then results in a Cook's distance. And so again, it's a way of you know doing a lot of modeling in simpler steps instead of doing them individually. Right. So you can see here is this is just a model for group A. And this is, then there's a model for group B, a model for group C, and a model for group D. And so it's a way of doing modeling for, you know, if you have to do it at the group level, or it's a way of, you know, giving you the ability to kind of, what's uh, the right word? kind of dueling a lot of work that would otherwise take a lot. I don't, I don't know the best way to explain that if somebody has a better way. And this unselect unnest function didn't really make sense to me. Um, but what it's doing is, you know, you feed it your data set and then it's selecting the group and then unnesting it, which is what produces this unnesting here. I think you need that because then, then earlier you did the map and with the glance function, then you have one column with, with your uh, subset of the data. So yeah. you have one column for the data and another column which contains all the matrix yeah. of the model. So you have so, one column for both the estimate and the p-value and so on. And then yeah. when you un unnest it, you, you have it in separate columns. Yeah, so I, but my wondering was why can't you, couldn't you then just pipe here at the end, just unnest and get the same thing? Because yeah, so I know it returns it as like a, a less data frame. But then from, from what I usually do is I just like unpipe here and then unnest whatever column I do. And I think it should pop up here, but I could be wrong. It should work. It's, it's just, I think two functions and you could do it as one single, yeah. single I think function. Either way, will, either way works. But yeah, so that's what it's doing. It's, it's, you know, when it returns it, it returns it as a list. And so you need to then, you know, grab whatever unnest it so you can you can get this view, otherwise it's not very helpful. And I think I can show you what it what it would look like. I think it's somewhere here. No, I can't find it, but anyway. So again, then you can do that. You can specify four different 
different, you know, metrics that you created within your list. And so, you know, you, you augmented in the glance version. So up here we were creating, you know, the tidied fit, the glanced version and the augmented version. And so, you know, this is the tidied version, this is the glance version, and this is the augmented version. And so, you know, it gives you the ability to, if you have, if you want to look at it at different uh, summer levels or different view, different, you know, more different, some metrics versus other metrics, then you, you have the ability to do that as well. And I think you can do the same thing. It's, and this kind of syntax is not only applicable to modeling, it's also applicable to a ggplot as well. And so you can kind of do that. I think if you then wanted to do like a QQ plot or whatever, if you wanted to then like add a QQ plot here, then you could do the map and the plot as well, if you wanted to include plots as well, and then unnest them as well. So you can, again, it's not just limited to modeling, you can put the plots in there as well. And so you can then, you know, again, almost super drive or overdrive or, you know, your work. So again, I talked about earlier, if you wanted to see, uh, when we talked about those interactions, if you wanted to see one without interaction and one with an interaction, and in this case, we're looking at just a normal linear regression versus that one that has uh, some literal math in it. And you can see the difference in that there is, I think, significance, or there is a difference and so you have the ability then to, you know, say, oh, I'm going to go with model two that it does have that math component in it. And so it gives you the ability to, you know, compare models and to say, um, I would like to go with the one that has the uh, interaction in it, not interaction, but sorry, the math aspect of it. Uh, this part. Um, okay, so then this part here, I think we have a couple minutes left. Yeah, this part was confusing, but okay. So you set your seed and then you're just running a distribution on one, one distribution and then a second distribution and then creating a function that will plot these, plot a histogram and so what you're going to do is you're going to, you know, take these distributions, put them in the function, and then output a plot. And then put distribution, second distribution into the function, and then output a second plot. And then the third distribution then is, in, is adding the first underscore one, u underscore one, and then u underscore two to kind of get to get the third distribution and evidently it's a triangle. So I don't quite understand why, I don't understand what this was help, trying to make me understand. So you can add columns. I think, again, it emphasizes the difference in, you know, using there are multiple ways of doing uh, the same thing. And so you can create a function that adds a, a column or you can just use the tidyverse or add column variable and they will eventually they will end up doing the same thing as well. And so you have, you know, Again, they're trying to reinforce that, you know, maybe modeling has a, we can carry over the tidyverse principles into the modeling in order to create a more uniform and consistent way of doing stuff, which leads into, I think the last section about, you know, tidy principles and tidy models. So they want to, you know, kind of human-centered one, human-centered fo focus where the functions are sensible, the defaults are the, using no default, so you have to explicitly, you know, say, you know, this is what I'm doing. So somebody who, you know, reads your script can say, you know, you don't fall into that, that issue of like setting your working directory or something like that, or 
um, you can avoid these kind of pitfalls and have, you know, explicitly say what you're going to do. And so recipes parsnip enable data frames to be used everywhere in the modeling process. And so it, um, it was mentioned like the step dummy or a step or any of these other step that we'll talk about later on. But it, again, it's like a more human centered and uh, kind of human centered focus with the consistency that, you know, somebody has the ability to come back and do exactly what you did on a continuing basis without there being much variation. So like, again, we talked about how there's different views of like you can use summary or you can use a glance that there is no, there's different, the consistency isn't there. So, you know, if we use the tidy models principles and use it in within, you can, you can do like the, the tidy function here. You can use the tidy function you can use the uh, to have a consistent output uh, and then it's consumable allowing you to solve complex problems by breaking them down into small pieces and so like that the ability to you know do a lot of models to one to one doing a lot of models repetitively without it being cumbersome is another principle that the one is apply is now going to be applied to tidy models and then it, it is inclusive because the tidy models is not the collection, it's not just the collection of packages, but it is also the community of people who use them. So, you know, there is repetitive feedback and uh, improvement on tidy models of this is not working or I don't understand this or, you know, arguments or anything of that nature. So just, so that's pretty much what chapter three was, was, you know, saying, tidy model, a modeling in R, you know, nothing, it's not bad the way people, we used to do it or the way it can be done now, but, you know, we want to have it more, you know, human-centered, consistent, and composable and inclusive uh, modeling process. So, you know, they've kind of, well, let's carry over the tidy principles and carrying the modeling. And so, you know, from that comes the creation of tidy models, which is, you know, the rest of the book, but. I hope that I think for me it was very informative to kind of I knew some modeling but I think this kind of gave me a groundwork and I think it is a good stepping stone and I think it was a necessary chapter to have in there and I think people who read this book shouldn't skip over it you know maybe at earlier I would have thought of skipping over it but I think it's you know it's very helpful to know there's you have these tools but I know I didn't leave that much room for discussion but Thank you. I really enjoyed that we had more, more discussion today than maybe previous week. So for me, it, it was really useful. I think with the design principles, part of that inconsistency in all these modeling packages comes just from the fact that so many different people worked on this and so many people contribute packages and they are at different like levels of knowing how to program well, sort of a lot of people who come into this are statisticians um, and they sort of know the stats and they're not software engineers. And then you sort of are self-taught and learn this and people take different approaches and then that has the advantage that you get so many different things, but it also means that often you get them in whatever that person thought was best at that time they wrote it. And then you get the big heterogeneity that you have. And then if you come to our wanting to learn all of this stuff, you have to learn so many different things. And hopefully what Tidy Models does is to let you learn one way and then do all of the translation to all of the different packages like carrot approach that um the mlr package um approach that way sort of like a unified interface and the tidy models is taking the tidy principles and trying to unify it
Yeah, and for me personally, I think that was like a roadblock in modeling was so many different ways to, you know, model. And it was very hesitant. And I think with the introduction of tidy models, it's like, well, it's kind of, okay, I know where to start. And I think it's, you know, this is my starting point. If I want to delve into, you know, other packages that, like you said, are more heavily stats focused or heavily like just different packages. If I'm really curious about it, I can, you know, delve into those areas. But for me, I think this chapter really emphasizes that point of, you know, this is their direction. And I think you, having this principle in a modeling is very, will help people who come into R or those who, you know, are kind of lost when it comes to modeling and the vast sea of packages out there and, you know, different ways of doing things. And another benefit that they've mentioned here that comes with, you know, trying to make this more unified method is like networking effects. Like if there's this one thing that a bunch of people are now using, it's easier to find help to have these discussions, you know, like the stuff we're talking about now. Whereas if it's you know, all these different broken up models, then if you're working on one, who knows who else is working on it. So when you go to ask for help, when you try and find someone who can help you with it or has had that problem, you know, it's such a specific package that you might be using. Whereas if this one, becomes more of a norm, it's much easier to get help when you need it, for example. Similar to how the tidy first uh, method does that with data analysis and stuff, this can do that with modeling. I guess you will always have packages for, for more rare types of models that are not, not integrated yet, so. So there are, there are so, so many models. And if I understand it, the tidy model team has to implement something or they, they have to advise the packages developer to change their interface or something. So some, some work needs to be done. So it, it will be good for the most, most uh, for the most often used models, but, but not for, for every model. Yeah, I mean, if you are wanting to write a package for sort of prediction mainly, like less with an inference focus, um, there is the hard hat package, which is a developer focused tidy models package. Um, so you could use that to do some of the heavy lifting of translating things. Um, well, I'd say, and it helps you write. R code that follows like our conventions, even if you're not necessarily aware of them, like that it's really nice to have a formula interface because some people develop methods and are just used to like having um, a matrix as an input. And that doesn't do any of like the um, encoding of dummy variables, for example, that we've seen. Um, and if you're new to that kind of thing and would like some help with how to structure it and how to make a modeling package, um, then there's the um, guide on sort of like what the tidy models team thinks is good practice for writing modeling packages and it get is accompanied by the hard hat package, which helps you put that in place, even if you don't know all of the software engineering details. So maybe if people know about that a bit more and like using it, then maybe that can help unify things a little bit. But I on the other thing also think that it's quite quite a cool part of R that there are so many different models. Hmm. So but we'll we'll see where the like balance is. But yeah, tidy models will probably not um, support every very specific modeling package but there's tools to sort of integrate more if this is a way that a lot of people find useful and want to use. Mm 